Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29, a Peachtree Hoops podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. I'm here today with Glenn Willis. He's a contributor for Peachtree Hoops and host of the Full Court Press podcast. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you, Kevin, for having me. Always fun to talk basketball with you. And, you know, a couple of days ago, I had Tyler on and we kind of poo-pooed going to Vegas. We even had, you know, Evan Turner on here talking about how he didn't want to get finessed in Vegas, and really, you know, you get off the plane and you instantly have swamp ass. So <laughs> today we're going to hype up Vegas because Glenn is there. Uh, I am. And tell us anything about your week of significance, good, bad, otherwise. Um. Well, it's uh, this year's been a little bit of a letdown just because there's so many draft picks that aren't playing. Like uh, just a ton <laughs> of them. Um, but if you're like me, I like to I like to watch guys that are trying to kind of take a step from like maybe playing in Europe and getting back to the NBA and seeing what they have. And they play hard, you know, because they're trying to really get noticed and all those sorts of things. It's, it's still good basketball to watch. It's, it's, you know, but the, if, you know, folks that came, you know, hyped to see Zion play, for example, only played the first half of his first game <laughs> um, and the second overall picks not playing. And I, I don't, I don't know how many of the guys in the lottery. Culver's yeah. done, right? He's done. Yeah, a lot of those guys aren't playing, but I I would imagine that that's impacting uh, the more normal <laughs> NBA fan uh, than me because I can go watch uh, a team that has maybe one or two NBA players on it and just really enjoy the game and kind of get to know that next kind of tier of guys that are trying to find a foot in the league. Um, so it's been overall good. Just you know, um, the the one miss in terms of just the really high profile guys just really not playing. The only only. Uh, kind of downside there is but i'm still still enjoying it just uh watched the game with um jeff and brad um so it was good to catch up with those gentlemen as well so i had a lot of friends here to, um that i kind of catch up here um uh you know every year if i haven't seen them or talked to them um since last time so all overall it's good so is brad behaving himself always <sighs> don't say always he doesn't always <laughs> behave himself sometimes he gets in trouble he he does sometimes, but uh, <laughs> when 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 I'm around, he's he tends to behave himself. So I'll just I'll leave it to that. I'm I'm not I'm not with him twenty four seven. So if he's doing wild and crazy things at two o'clock in the morning. I, I have no I have no <laughs> uh, knowledge of it. So all right, uh, Jabari Parker is reportedly a member of the Atlanta Hawks. What did you think about this signing? Uh, it's a bit of a head scratcher, you know, in, in terms of um, kind of expect them to kind of work on the margins of with with the cap space they had, and um, but not take a guy that was drafted so high, has such a high profile, and and also you know you hear Travis Flink talk about his requirements, dribble, pass, and shoot, and Jabari Parker's not noticeably good at all of those things, um, but you know I. You know, I went back and kind of looked across his career and seen, you know, what environment such he's been. And we, we all know he's dealt with the injuries, and that's been a setback in terms of just not being able to be consistently doing those developmental activities that a guy that young would be doing. And it's hard to know how much that impact that has impacted his trajectory, if it would be have gone a lot better had he not had to deal with those things. Um, but I look back, like, has he ever been in a good coaching situation? And I'd have to say, no, I'm not a big fan of Jason Kidd. And I'm, I meant to make a list of all of his head coaches before we got I got have into it. this. You have the full list, like everybody. I believe so. Yeah, so right. What's the full list? The full list is Jason Kidd until right. Jason Kidd was fired. 
and then um Prunty as a Joe, Joe Prunty long term interim coach, right? Yeah, yeah. And Sean Sweeney was kind of the offensive coach there and that, so Sean Sweeney probably had more to do with what Jabari was trying to do <laughs> that that last half of that season or whatever. Then in Chicago, what Fred Hoiberg for about three or four weeks and then Jim Boylan uh, was the interim coach. Then surprisingly to me and others, uh, he was named kind of the ongoing permanent coach because in, in my mind, when you have a talent, young talent like a Larry Markin and, and, and guys like that, um, a number of guys on that team that if you just kind of put out a coach wanted kind of sign, the best coaches in the league are to come asking for that job. It's just like when the Bucks finally realized they needed to just get the best coach that they could get for Giannis. You know, as soon as they said that job was open, Bud was there asking about the job. Bizdo was there asking about the job. Dwayne Casey, you know. Right. And, and it seems like Chicago just passed on an opportunity to say, like, who, who has interest in coming here? And who, you know? who is this coach in Washington? This coach in Washington was Scott Brooks. Scott um, Brooks. Okay, so that's, that's the full list then. That's the full list. And Scott Bricks isn't my favorite coach in the league, but he's a legitimate coach. He's probably the best coach on this list, I would think. Not as a low bar. <laughs> but uh, Right. But, but it, then I'll, it was uh, also the place I think Jabari was the happiest. Yeah, it was. It, because uh, Scott is a player's coach. And, you know, I think Scott basically did look to let Jabari do the kinds of things he likes to do, which aren't always constructive for winning basketball. But if he could get better and more consistent at – you know, uh, scoring um, in the way that he can, he was projected to do that. Maybe he could help a team. And then, but it also to look at the, the point guards because now he's coming. You know, we, one of the things when we look forward um, at the organization is is one of the things often talked about and kind of hit on as a theme of why they have to be optimistic is that good players are going to want to tr- play with Trey Young because he's such a great passer, and that they're going to you know be in a situation where a guy like one or two years from a contract come you know put up really good numbers because he's got one of the best passers in the league delivering him the ball and giving him a uh, good look and things like that but look back at his uh point guards <laughs> brandon knight michael carter williams <laughs> year two michael carter williams and davis vasquez then matthew del Vadova, and then malcolm brogdon it's kind of and then the the last year he was there they kind of were fitting Giannis into the kind of point guard situation then in chicago he had chris dunn um, Zach Levine dominates the basketball and, and kind of looks like a point guard sometimes, even though it's not. And then Ryan Archidiakono. That's the whole list of his point guards he's had to play with, too. And so I'm it, not saying is this, this is a big... Is this Travis Schlenk trying to identify the new inefficiency in the system? Because it seems like a repeat of Alex Len. Like, it could maybe, be. Maybe the reason this guy isn't good is because he's never played with a point guard before. It could, Yeah, it could be. And he's... Um, always been on a roster where, where the roster was so poorly constructed from an offensive creation situation that it kind of fell to him to do it. And I think he wanted to do it, but I think the one thing that we can kind of look at here and go, mm, maybe this could be a fit is him to realize that he shouldn't be the primary creator, but if he can work with a very good primary creator, then maybe that can unlock some of the other things and he can become a more, a more efficient player. And so I want to be careful and say, I'm not saying that these are reasons to be sure this is going to go really well. I'm saying if you're a Hawks fan and you want some reasons to be optimistic that it could go well, I mean, a bad coaching situation and a bad point guard situation uh, pretty much his entire career so far, I think uh, you know, smart people around the league uh, tend to think that Lloyd Pierce is doing a really good job so far in his time in Atlanta and respect what he's doing there. And then Trey is, in my mind, already one of the best five passers in the league. He was um, second league assist only to Russell Westbrook, the stat hunting leader of the NBA. Um, <laughs> you know, so I mean, if if Jabari can kind of settle in and into the role that probably was probably was always going to eventually be best for him in terms of not being the primary creator, but having some offensive prowess that if if, if put in with the right group of players could turn into something you know pretty unique so where the hawks are what in terms of how um their trajectory looks in terms of being a really competitive team why not take a year or two you know and and see how this goes it's, it's kind of a low risk in my in my view um and some it may not be a very incredibly high possibility of a good a, a big reward but it's kind of low risk potentially 
good reward outcome. Uh, so I can't really criticize it. Although I will say, when I first saw the notification, then my first response was to scratch my head and go, what is, what is this about? Yeah, I, I think I would kind of go a little bit the other direction as far as the primary creation. I, I hear you, and I think as far as you know, the list of point guards that he's played with is pretty dismal. If you compare that list to the list of a typical, what is it now, fifth-year player, sixth-year player? Uh, but at the same time, you know, if I try to figure out where he sort of pencils into this rotation, if he is in the rotation, it kind of feels like, number one, he's the backup point guard. And number two, it feels like the Hawks are kind of just eschewing the whole idea of even having a backup point guard. Like, you know, they've got Evan Turner, who, you know, maybe can lead an offense or at least co-lead an offense and maybe Parker like along with maybe others like Cam Reddish again would just kind of have a few different creators not necessarily one sort of dominant creator with that bench unit but just kind of split it up amongst two or three people and not really even play all that much of a of a point guard maybe they're going to try to do some switching or something like that and have a bunch of similar size guys I don't know but I just you know it feels like because I think that's really the strength of his game. It's it's weird. This is this we're talking about Damian Jones too, but it really hasn't it really haven't been that many situations since Travis Schlink has been here where they've put a guy on the roster who either wasn't a a good three point shooter or b somebody they thought would be a good three point shooter. I think we've seen enough of Jabari to know that he's not going to be a good three point shooter, but he might be you know, a good mid-range shooter and to exploit that, maybe they put the ball in his hands more. Yeah, it could be. And, and if you look at, you know, what one possibly good outcome could be for Parker as he tries to kind of um, kind of recreate himself as NBA player is Evan Turner, you know. And yeah. you know, Turner's on the roster and perhaps what, you know, part of the plan is to kind of, hey, Jabari, look at what how Evan's helping our team. He's, you know, visualize these things. These are some ways that you can help our team. Because some of their limitations are the same. They can't shoot. Um, they're not great. Uh, they don't have great lateral quickness. Um, but Evan Turner knows how to use his size. And then Evan Turner knows how to uh, move the basketball uh, and, and, and create um, for his team. Um, usually on second units, he's not the guy you want handling a possession you know, down to one or two points at the end of an important game. You know, but that... You, but, uh, you know, maybe it's not such a coincidence that Turner's on the roster and now Parker is too, and they see some um, kind of uh, overlap in terms of what they, you know, giving Jabari a path back to potentially having real solid footing in the league. That's, could, a, that, that could that's be an interesting comparison. Uh, that's an interesting comparison. Parker's such a wreck, or at least to this point in his career, he's really had a lot of trouble defensively, and you mentioned that he doesn't really move his feet well laterally. And it's it's remarkable. I think that he has the biggest differential between his vertical explosiveness and his lateral quickness. Like, I don't think I've ever seen anybody who struggled moving laterally as much as he does. And at the same time, you know, for a guy who's come off two serious knee injuries, his vertical burst at times is, can be just astounding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. kind of confounding to, to to see both of those things out of the same player. Yeah, and I, I got a, another guy that kind of is in that mold that I, Hawks fans will probably have a negative reaction when I say it, but and and his, and his cancer is a little bit like that. Like running in a straight line, he's fast, he's explosive, he's a jumper, but always a better offensive rebounder, a defensive rebounder, and always kind of more explosive athlete when he's moving forward or getting the jump off of two feet. But you know. I, I think a lot of people don't realize how much Canner has improved the last couple of seasons. I, I talked about it on the last podcast I did with my, my brother, Greg, the Full Court Press podcast. We're doing the free agent kind of analysis. And I was like, you know, the Celtics signed him. And I was like, that's not a joke signing. He really helped the Blazers uh, last sure. year. And he, and he wouldn't have been able to do that had he not improved from when he was called can't play Cantor in OKC. You know, if he, if he was still that guy, he wouldn't be getting these opportunities, you know. Yep. Um, and so it's not, you know, Parker, you know, is getting I think a, a good opportunity with a, a team that, um, you know, is is uh, has a solid track record even if it's only been a year. Um, 
in, in player development and kind of go into an environment. It's, it's, it's a little bit also like when we talk about Cam Reddish as a draftee. You know, he gets to go into a low-pressure environment and, and kind of make the most of himself. It's a perfect situation for him had he been drafted, like, by Chicago in the top five and you know, had been expected to be their best player from day one. That probably was not going to go well for him. And But, you know, Parker drafted uh, really, really high. Um, has not at all uh, been on the path that people thought that he would be on, but he, he comes into a situation where it's a low pressure upper opportunity. And so, you know, I living in, uh, you know, I just recently moved out to Seattle, but I lived in Minnesota for 11, like 11 years and just being plugged into the Midwest. I mean, he, the kids from Chicago I played in Milwaukee and you can't find a single person to say a bad thing about him yeah. as a person. And so that, you know, it's, it's just really easy to root for and hope that he can, uh, you know, without the pressure of, um, and, you know, and he was also like competing with Giannis. I mean, back in the day, he, Mark Parker, they had a whole lot more hope for Parker being the superstar and Giannis being a, uh, could maybe be a second player to him. And that, and all of the organizational energy kind of rightly going to Giannis was, was the thing that was probably hard for him to deal with as well. And, and now he can just, you know, go to a, an organization that uh, believes they're on the rise and believes in the fundamentals of what they're doing and could just be one more guy in that, um, in, in that organization, hopefully finding, finding his way again. Yeah. I was covering the bucks when they drafted Parker. And I remember those, you know, that first season where the fans were literally split. I mean, it was half the people thought that really it was, it was going to be Giannis's team. Giannis was going to be the top dog and half thought it would be Jabari. It, oh, it was like, it, it it's was amazing like, uh, in retrospect. It was like the movie Twilight, where I don't, I don't know, I've never seen it, but it was like Team Edward and Team something. It's like you were one or the other, you couldn't be both. <laughs> I have to ask my daughter to refresh my memory on the movie, but I remember it being kind of like that. It's kind of amazing. I, you know, I was trying to get some stats before we started on Jabari, and you go to Basketball Reference, and it's like, you know, they do it the, at the bottom of their Basketball Reference page. You know, they they look at your win shares and they do the player comparison finder, you know, who, who had the most comparable career to yours through this many seasons of your career. And one of the players, you know, one of the top 10 players compared to Jabari is Andrew Wiggins, who was, you know, number one in the draft where Jabari went number two before Embiid. And that's crazy. And, and one of these guys is on a max contract and one, is trying to reinvent himself as an NBA player. It it kind of feels to me a little bit, you know, it's it's a two year deal. I think I should just guess the number. I think I heard, you know, roughly thirteen million with a player option in the second year. And to me, it almost feels like a one year contract in the vein, you know, in the sense that if he plays well, he'll be out, and if he plays poorly or if something goes wrong, you know. It's not like they can't just buy him out for next season in a season where they have such a ridiculous amount of cap space next year. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And 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 I don't. We don't want to do the exercise like right now, but you really have to look at when do we think the Hawks will uh, be serious about um, managing themselves to being over the cap team. So that's you're know, looking at probably giving John Collins an extension and, and then the, you know, a year later, likely giving Trey Young an, an extension. And right. then who, knows, who knows what will come of the, the guys that they just drafted, you know? Um, but these next two years are going to happen. You know, he'll, he'll be clear of before that Collins extensions would hit the books, right. you know? Um, and so it's, it, there's no issue at all in terms of them punting on any financial leverage they would, or flexibility they have in the future. Does this tell us something about the future of Vince Carter? I mean, it seems like they've signed another backup power forward and they've used a lot of roster spots. I mean, they created one in the Chandler Parsons trade, but uh, you know, there really aren't that many roster spots left. They might get one back if, if Jalen Adams, you know, if they don't guarantee his contract. But do you think that, that this is telling us something about the direction of the team with respect to Vince? I think it does. And to me, it's less about roster spots because there are a couple of guys that could still buy out or not. Um, you know, Jalen Adams is not you know, close to a sure thing in the roster, but playing time at his position. So looks, rotation like spots. It, yeah. It looks like there's no playing time. And, and 
Um, if Vince wants to play, I think there are, I think there's other obstacles to, to the, even close the amount of playing time he got last year. So that tells me he's probably going to be playing somewhere else. Okay. But I'm still hoping he does because he's fun, he's fun, you know, and all those sorts of things. But, hey, he's Vince Carter. He should, if he wants to play, then he should go where he can play. I hear you. Uh, anything else on Jabari before we move on? No, I'm, I'm looking at it as a, you know, only no, no real downside to the decision. And I'm, I'm rooting for the, for the, for the kid and, uh, it, it'll take some time to see if this works out for him and the team. And, um, uh, but I'll be rooting for him all, all the way. All right. Yeah. I, 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 I'm really optimistic about it, uh, just because I think he'll do well with the ball in his hands and I think he'll have the opportunity. Mean, I think that's what he does best and he'll do it with a better supporting cast and in a low pressure situation just coming off the bench. I don't, you know, you know, I don't think there's any point in the season where he's going to be a starter unless the season goes really, really wrong. So, you know, if he accepts that role, I think it's one in which he can thrive. So it seems like the Hawks are revamping their backup front court uh, in addition to signing a, a new backup power forward uh, Omari Spellman has been traded to Golden State and in exchange they get from Golden State Damian Jones who probably fills some of the gap at center does that sound right I think so um it's so hard to evaluate young guys who played in the, the context of those great Golden State Warriors teams <laughs> Um, because when it came down to it, when you're trying to win a championship in those you know, eighth, ninth, tenth spot, you know, across the regular season, and then you know, in some of the postseason, you just want guys who aren't going to screw up. And young guys are going to screw up. That's how you learn. You know, learn from your mistakes. And it, it's hard to earn playing time uh, in that situation. So I don't really know what to make of uh, Jones as an NBA player right now. Um, he played more than 400 minutes this last year, and I don't think he'd ever hit 100 on any prior season. So small sample size across even even three seasons. I do remember um, him being kind of hyped a little bit in that draft class in terms of his ability to move for his size. I didn't watch a ton of him at Vanderbilt, um, but it seems to me like I'm going to guess that he's if, if you look at what he's going to do, it's going to be a little bit like when Miles Plumley was in the rotation in that, at least right now, Jones isn't a shooter. Um, he did improve his free throw for shooting to 65% last year, so that always makes you wonder if you know, he could be taught. They, they taught plenty of things how to shoot, but you know when Plumley would play, he would just just dive to the rim in the pick and roll or sit in the ducker spot and let like Collins or whoever else dead in a function on the perimeter and those sorts of things. So Jones certainly profiles as a guy who should be very good in the pick and roll. And, and the value of Plumlee um, the last last year, especially even as much as fans kind of wanted to, ha- to hate on him, if Devin got injured and when Devin got injured and when Alex Lynn was missing from injury, it would suck to have a point guard like Trey Young and have that next guy that doesn't want to play but has to play because of injury to not be good in the pick and roll because that's where Trey's, you know, is at his best in the half court, you know. So Plumlee had value in that he could go in there and Trey had a pick and roll partner when other guys weren't healthy or weren't available or what have you. And I think Jones is going to kind of be like that. And then we'll see if there's been more development going on that we didn't get to see because he rarely played for Golden State. Um, you know, the, I think the bigger news here is them moving on from Amari, and we could talk about that if you want to. Um, but I, I, in terms of bringing in Jones and I think it's a 2026 20, second round pick, um, you know, you get to try out Jones for, for one year, but he'll be, um, you know, up for a restricted free agency after the season. And he seems like a guy that if you even extend the qualifying offer, he would just take it. I mean, projecting where he he to likely be a year from now. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll see what he brings. Um, but, um, it, the one thing that I found really interesting was that Travis Link was part of the front office that drafted Damian Jones in Golden State. So, there, there may be some intel, intel that he has um, that um, was material to making this trade. I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know. Yeah, I'm sure it's a player he's like. It's always funny when you see sh- 
to see Schlenk trade with Golden State. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see Spellman go to Golden State because, you know, for so many years, it's like, you know, I kind of want to see what Steph Curry looks like when they can play just five out. Like, he's never really had that kind of spacing. He's always played with Draymond and uh, Kavon Looney and Damian Jones and Andrew Bogut and Zaza Pachulia. Jordan you know, Bell. Jordan yeah. Bell. I mean, it's they've always figured out a way to get by, you know, with some of their own guys lurking around the rim. I wonder if, you know, if, if they can do some things with Spellman to create more space uh, just because, you know, Spellman can shoot, I think. I mean, again, we're dealing with really small samples, but I just, in terms of what he he brings to the court, you know, if, if they can play a big who can space the floor, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a new world for Steph Curry in terms of, you know, if he's playing off the ball, and it's, it's kind of weird this year because they're going to have such a dinged up lineup, but, you know, when he plays off the ball, if, you, if he gets it, you've got to close out hard. And, you know, it's, it's always been a little weird for Steph, I think, attacking the basket. And it's not that he's not a good finisher, but there's a difference between being a good finisher when there's one to no guys there versus two to one guy. You know, either a half guy versus one and a half guys. Well, you know, it always feels like now, Steph, when Steph attacks the rim, there's one and a half guys there waiting for him, even if he's totally beaten his old man who had to close out hard on him. So, I don't know. I'm 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 happy for Omari. I, I think it's a good situation for him. He gets to he gets reunited with his old college teammate Eric Pascal. Maybe maybe they can be roommates and live together and maybe he'll you know, happy and a fresh start and a new outlook and I and I think he'll do well. But I think it's it's funny that that I it is just a little bit funny to me how you know, when Travis Schlenk got here it was just shooting, 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 shooting. I mean everything was shooting, you know. Why was Jalen Adams here? Because he could shoot. You know, they gave Jordan Seibert a ten day. Why? Because he can shoot. You know, they they drafted shooters. Kevin Herter. You know, he can he can do a lot of things, but he can shoot. Every every player that they added, they thought Alex Lang could shoot. They thought Dwayne Dedman could shoot. Ursan Ilyasova could shoot. I mean, it just seemed like all the acquisitions were about shooting. And then the last three players that they've added, I don't know how you sequence all these moves, but you know, in my mind, and you look at what they're doing with their bench this season: Evan Turner, Damian Jones. And, uh, you know, Jabari Parker. And it's it's not about shooting. And, you know, maybe they're getting some different things. They feel like they need something different, but it feels like a shift away from the shooting a little bit. Yeah, and, uh, and maybe they feel like they have all, all the ball-dominant players that they want. You know, I mean, you, I think there's a saying about you can never have too many wings. You know, we hear that all the time. But I do think that um, you have to be mindful about bringing in guys who – their primary value is playing on the ball, but you already have like your three or four guys that you want handling the ball most of the time. And so that's where Jones might be a better fit than Omari, for example, because Omari's a good, good with the ball, you know, for, right. especially for, for his size. Um, and then again, like we talked about Parker and, and, and Turner, but, you know, um, we'll, we'll see how much facilitation they do, even though they're not shooters. And then there's also the kind of the wild card of do any of them actually turn into shooters through the player development? I, I don't know, but it does seem like <laughs> it, it does seem like there's some diversification happening at this point, which was kind of not what we've seen in, until now. Basically, I, I think you're right. I think this is a different thing. If if Chris Gent was going to teach Evan Turner to shoot, he would have done it when he was at Ohio State. He would have been That's like he he, he would have taught him. You know, he would have you know shared the Ohio State secrets with him. For sure. <laughs> you kind of, yeah, you kind of, oh, sorry. I'm thinking, I think I'm more thinking about the young guys that might have it in them. I so see. Be taught to shoot a little bit. Okay. So, so uh, you led me to this before, but I ended up going another direction, but you brought up the point that, you know, Travis Schlenk was there in the Golden State front office when they drafted Jones. And, you know, one of the things I did was I tried to dig up anything that I could find on that. And I found some audio of Schlenk talking about Jones. And this would have been, midway through Damian Jones's first season uh he got hurt so I don't think he did much of training camp that year uh, but what he said was you know for Jones coming out of college you know they looked at what he could do defensively and they said he was an outstanding athlete he called him one of the most athletic guys for his size you know they said he had a 38 inch vertical leap 
uh, you know, at 6'11", he, he thought that, you know, gave him a lot of potential. And what they saw at Vanderbilt was that he paid a lot of power forward at Vanderbilt. And in those situations, they switched a lot of pick and rolls and he could move his feet and stay in front of people. Uh, I'm sure that that's one thing that they're going to be counting on now, especially with Deadman gone. You know, I think that gives them an option when they need that sort of thing. They don't really have that on their roster. Uh, maybe Fernando is that, but I don't think we know that yet. Um, and Jones might be a little bigger in terms of how vertical he can get. So, uh, but then on the other hand, you know, you mentioned that you know with, with your comparison to Plumley that he was a lob threat. You know, coming out of college. Schlenk said he wasn't that at the time, but in Santa Cruz, he learned how to do it. You know, he said at Vanderbilt, he was a back-to-the-basket player. They played a lot of the Princeton offense, and it was really at Santa Cruz where he did that. So he's kind of new to being a lob threat, but he's made himself, if you look at the numbers, he's made himself an outstanding finisher around the rim. Yeah, yeah, and you know, his catch radius, given his frame, is, is big, and not that Trey needs a guy to have an enormous catch radius, but it just kind of opens things up, so... Uh, but, but again, you know, in terms of, I think what Travis Link is looking to figure out is, you know, with some of the limitations that John Collins has defensively, not the biggest, bulkiest guy, not the strongest defensive rebounder is, what's the right type of player to put next to him at the five? And I think with, I think that's one of the reasons that um, Bruno was drafted is that he could develop into being a, a good rim protector. He's going to be probably an above average, at least rebounder. And those are the types of things that, um, you know, they're, they're looking maybe for, for him. And Damian Jones, Damian Jones might be in that same category of, you know, a pretty big five, a pretty big defensive anchor that can also move if you're wanting to, to lean on uh, switching more heavily um, in the future. That Here's two guys that um, you get to see what that looks like, at least the, at least this year. You know, for Fernando, obviously you hope for more than that. And, and if – if things go well for Damian Jones this year, maybe, maybe another year or two, we'll see. But, um, you know, to, to really when they really want to say, OK, we're ready to start ascending and really starting to try to function as a team that wants to contend, really contend, they've got to figure out you know, the roster construction that's going to work to really bring the right kind of support around Trey and, and John. Um, and I think kind of turning over the center position kind of the way they are. In this offseason is a is a swing at you know what what does this roster structure look like you know um, Amari was never going to give them that Amari's always probably going to have more offensive value than defensive value it was the development of Collins um, becoming a really good scorer and a really good offensive rebounder um, you know it's really trying to find out you know what other kinds of players types of players what types of skills you know, in players we want to put around these guys to so we know when we're ready to ascend that we we know we have um, some really um, experiential information to base that on, and it'll it could be, it'll be fun to see how it works out, you know. But I was a little disappointed that Amari was sent out. Everybody, I think everybody had the question of were the Hawks frustrated with him in terms of his conditioning and his body. Was that a thing? Did they kind of say to themselves, well, we're going to give him until? You know, summer league to kind of come, if he comes in and shape assess. I don't know how much of it was Golden State really valued him the way you talked about, or the Hawks were kind of just done with him or down on him or kind of hit a breaking point or a little bit of both. You know, but um, because even just in the last few days, obviously, you know, they were saying positive things about him. Uh, um, Greg Foster had positive things to say after a second Amari's uh, second summer league game. So, but those coaches and front office people have to say positive things about the same people, no matter what the situation is. Um, sure. So, I mean, I, I assume no, some, right. some point down the line, we'll kind of know more of the truth of what was the, you know, was Golden State just really super interested or were the Hawks kind of like, um, you know, he's never really going to fit next to John great, you know, or the conditioning. Who, who knows? But I right. just like, you know, I'll be rooting for Amari in Golden State too and hope, hope that that's a good place for him to, kind of, uh, you know, um, grow into being a really good player. You, know? you mentioned, uh, you know, pairing somebody with John Collins. I was kind of hoping for it to come up. Did you listen to that Low Pope's podcast with John? I, I did. I listened to it last night while I was eating dinner. Okay. I w- I, it didn't come up, but I was wondering if he was going to ask him about just, I thought there was just a huge, like, you don't see many switch flips in the NBA, but it felt to me like 
I don't know. I don't know the exact timing, but I'll say last two months, like all of a sudden John just started playing defense and he really hadn't before that. <laughs> right. Am should, I being... I, no, I, you, I wrote the draft profile on John Collins and it was not glowing for Peter Hughes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, I, and but the, what I didn't know when I wrote it was that basically, if you believe the story, is that Danny Manning just said, don't pick up fouls on defense. Because right. He, 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 remind listeners, he led the country in PER. Yep. <laughs> and he was the entire Wake Forest offense. And yep. when I look at kind of how they played and how they kind of approached trying to win games, I was like, oh, he basically was told to be a statue on defense just to not pick up fouls because he was their whole offense. And then, uh, you know, of course, I wrote into the draft profile. He doesn't have uh, uh, additional length. I, I mean, I, I called it as positive, like he's – probably the fastest big in that draft class and he is really fast and his explosiveness and his ability to maintain balance and you know with shooting facing up back to the basket you know, he had all sorts of scoring prowess but you just didn't know is he going to get to be a primary scorer on an NBA team is he good enough to do that you know and those sorts of things but yeah I mean and he, he certainly tried the last two months of this last NBA season and he sounds like a guy that at least wants to be respected as a defender and not be, you know, for sure. Kind of, kind of viewed as a one way player in the way that some players are. No, I mean, he wants to be an all-star and that's going to be, that's going to be part of the territory. Uh, I, I was just surprised. I mean, I was just kind of hoping that that would come up and it didn't come up. You know what else came up on that podcast? It's Mia culpa time. Oh, <laughs> we don't call plays for JC. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it was supposed to be a complimentary thing when I wrote that story, and it got bounced around and recycled, and he got asked that question a few times subsequently after I wrote that. But, I mean, you know, Pierce was trying to make the point that his offense was coming just in the natural flow of their offense that includes a ton of pick and rolls for John Collins and pick and pops for John Collins. And there's a lot of stuff there for John Collins, but it's not a specific play, hey, I'm going to run a play, and the goal here is to get John Collins the ball because it's just the base offense is for John Collins. And he, at the time, and really through the whole season and at the end of the season, he was putting up ridiculous offensive numbers. And so, you know, the the point there was to just say he's doing this and he's doing it efficiently. There's there's no wasted there's no wasted possessions, no empty calories. He, he was you know there are no plays being run for him. He's just getting them in the natural flow of things and. I guess he didn't like that. And maybe it's because it got pinged around. And I mean, it, yeah. in my story, it was like the fifth paragraph is just kind of, you know, supportive evidence. Right. And then, yeah, it became headlines some other places and he didn't like it. So I'm sorry, John. Yeah, it's funny how <laughs> once you write something and put something out there, you have no control of what it becomes. And it wasn't or... a question I asked either. Lloyd Pierce offered that up unsolicited. Right. So I used it. Oh, and it's funny. It's funny, though, you know, coming off of an obviously great season that, that J.C. had last year, I don't remember a single time where they were just threw the ball into him in the post and said, go to work, ever. No. I mean, the, the only one I can think of, actually, was that game they won in Philly. They The play was designed for Herter, but Philly switched, and Herter was basically running out of time and just tossed it down to John, who had a smaller guy on him, and John just... And I remember Herter even going, like, shoot. I think he just outright told John, shoot it. Because John was like, well, this play, <laughs> John was like, 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 this play wasn't run for me, to, which backed up your story. Right. <laughs> um, and John did make a little turnaround and put the game away. You know, that, I don't think, I think that's the only time they ever just threw it into him. Yeah. And, and Collins is the kind of player that he's so active that the ball's just going to find him on yep. your normal possessions. And, and, and I know that's what you meant. But it's, it seems that John didn't take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> he is a good sport. I mean, but yeah, this is funny. And, uh, you know, you get to see his post game, but it's like, it's like, when does he get his low post opportunities? It's like, if there's an offensive rebound and he doesn't like turn it into a tip in or a tip dunk or something, you know, where he's just got an angle to the rim. If he has to reset, then all of a sudden it's a post up and He's really good when he does it. Yep. Uh, it'll be interesting how they use that going forward. Uh, but let's go to the backup bench for a minute because, you know, a few minutes ago you were talking about, you know, pairing with John Collins, Damian Jones, Bruno Fernando. Uh, 
before we get into the summer league and Fernando, how do you think the Hawks approach that backup center position? Like if, if you have to pick somebody to, let's assume that Alex Len is the starter, you know, the first time Alex Len goes out of the game in October, you know, who's going to get slotted in behind him? Um, that's going to be interesting to find out. I'll, I'm not going to be surprised if it's Jones first. Um, uh, it, you know, you and I talked before on prior, previous podcasts how, you know, they have to figure out what they have in DeAndre Bembry this year, you know, because they you know, figure out do they want to work on an extension, uh, you know, how do they want to be aggressive or just or wait and see what kind of offer he might get from the team uh, as a restricted bridge next year. And Jones is on that same timeline now. And um, But on top of that, I think the thing that's going to work the most against Bruno just getting slid, slid right into that backup center position is he's going to be super foul prone early in his career. Um, and and so um, if that kind of ends up messing up with the rotation, and with, you know, with foul trouble at the bigs can kind of um, cause your rotation to get mucked up for the whole rest of the game and <laughs> get, get, get you way off the plan. Um, so I'm going to guess that Jones being, you know, just having had the experience of, you know, being part of a really, really good quality organization for three years, um, it's just going to have his bearings more. And then I think I, my best guess is that Jones would be the backup and then, um, you know, uh, Bruno will be in a developmental and kind of a, maybe not in the rotation every game or just play some garbage time. But as Bruno potentially proves that he can play defense without fouling too often, then, then I think it becomes a, co- a competition for Bruno. Okay. All right, so tell me about today's Summer League game. The Hawks won. What stood out for you? Who do you want to talk about? Oh, Kill. well, Kill what? If, I, if I seem distracted, I, I keep checking my notifications to find out if the Hawks have given Tajir McCall a contract yet. <laughs> <laughs> he was so much fun. Um, I, I had to go do a little bit of research on him because he—I didn't know when I first saw him on the roster. I—I I I really had no clue who he was. Um, and I try to be pretty up on all all the players that are potential NBA players, you know. But he was not in kind of in my catalog. Um, but he, his last two seasons in college, he was uh, Ohio Valley Conference Defensive Player of the Year. After watching him play just two summer league games, that does not surprise me. Uh, I mean, his awareness and recognition and instincts are incredibly good. Um, his his willingness and to help as a defender. I mean, I, there was a time today where, like, not his man, but another man that, uh, on uh, Indiana was dribbling the ball just to the top of the key, and the guy that Taj was guarding just kind of walked within to about 15 feet of the ball handler and Taj ran over and did a like three second um, kind of double team that were and noticed if this guy got far enough away that he had to run like and so every tiny little thing that you're looking for a player to do to like all of the help all of the, the blue collar stuff you know getting on the floor for balls he he's blown me away and today he had 15 points seven rebounds four assists um, he's really good off the ball in offense he like four or five times a day, really well-timed cuts, um, those sorts of things. He took two charges today. Um, and so I, I, I was just like, give this guy a contract. I mean, what are we even doing? <laughs> Jalen Adams get over the roster. And I don't, I don't want to crap on Jalen. Jalen looks like he's still a little bit hurt. He didn't play yeah. the first game because he's great, right. but he looks a little limited um, and stuff. But, yeah, I'm like, please sign this guy before some other team does. I, I don't know if he'll ever be an NBA player. But just to even bring a guy like that in, into your organization that does all the little things, it just kind of ups the ante for everybody else to, to do them too, and it makes for a really good competitive kind of situation. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, I, don't, I never want to look at two games and, and say this is what this guy is offensively, but he's knocked down a few perimeter shots. He's attacks the rim when the big is out of the paint. He has his situation awareness is excellent. Um, he'll come in and, you know, set a useful kind of, even if it was unplanned kind of, you know, um, pick, you know, just to kind of get in the way of, you know, a guy that's guarding one of his teammates and stuff. So he's just, man, I hope you play whatever 
other games the Hawks have here, I don't know how many they'll play. It doesn't seem like they're going to be lining up to be very, or they want to be very competitive in the, the tournament. But <laughs> I, I, this this guy is Tajir McCall. A week ago, two days ago, I don't know who he was. And right now I'm like, I cannot wait to watch this guy play again. <laughs> he covers a lot of ground. He does. Coming into this game, he, he was outstanding today. Coming into this game, it, it, it felt to me a little bit like he'd make, you know, five really good plays, but also like two just kind of head scratchers. Uh, a little bit mistake prone and turnover prone, but you know, Pierce Lloyd Pierce was on the broadcast comparing him to Tony Allen. Yeah, I guess you were in the arena, so you didn't get to hear it, but I didn't. And it's always a little bit ridiculous when you hear somebody, you know, comparing summer league guys to another player who was first team all defense, but you watch that game and it's like, it's not crazy. <laughs> well, I, I and I, I mean, with the, with the charges and everything, I and give his size. I know Tony Allen wasn't the biggest guy, but he'd play up all the way to the power forward position sometimes. But he reminded uh, Taj reminded me a little bit of Patrick Beverly when I was watching him today. Just like the defensive range he has, like he can get from like one side of the court all the way to the rim in like it's an instant, and it's like you know it's incredible how much awareness he has. I, I remember one play, it's funny because uh, he was, there was, I think there were like two minutes left in the first quarter and on offense, he had made one, one I think one of his bad plays that he fell down and lost the ball. He's not awesome with the ball in his hands, <laughs> um, like you said, but it, he ended up being the last guy to cross half court. But the, the, the guy in the Pacers that took the shot was in the far, far corner for that short three-point shot, and he ran. He just sprinted 70 feet and closed out. And he saw the play the whole way. You could see him sprinting, like, I've got to get there and close out. And sure enough, the, uh, it, he didn't get a block or a tip or anything, but he, he impacted the shot. The shot was off. Um, but after that, he was just like, yeah, I'm done. I can't even get up. <laughs> but that 70-foot sprint to close out on a, sh- on a shooter was just incredible. But I mean, he did let things like that like 10, 12, 13 times today. It's just amazing to watch that. It, it's a, if fans are at all familiar with what Zaire Smith could be for the Sixers uh, to be give, to have a more realistic comparison than um, one of the best defenders in the history of the NBA. <laughs> um, <laughs> Zaire Smith, I think Taj McCall could be a little bit of what uh, the Philly is well hoping Zaire Smith could have. That he just has a ton of defensive range. I mean, Pierce him. coached Tony Allen. He, he brings that up a lot. Sure. I'm sure he, I'm sure the, at some point, like two years from now, the players would be tired. Yeah, we know you coach Tony Allen. Enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might, not, might be sooner than two years. At the same time, I feel like if you know, there's no assistant GM, so uh, if, if Travis had to like leave the country for three months and go incommunicado, and <coughs> the ownership was like, "Okay, Lloyd, you're in charge of the team. You get it, get us organized between now and October." I feel like he'd give McCall a spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's funny when you watch a handful of players here that just stand out to you, and when they're in that group of guys that they only have an NBA contract right now, don't even have a, a non-guarantee contract right now. Right. If, if I had to put a list, a short list together of guys who, to me, look like they should uh, have um, something more than per, perhaps a camp contract, those famous, like, what, twenty twenty five thousand dollar $25,000 contracts, 50000 I think is the most they can do. I have to go look that up, but... You know, I I hope at least he's going to be on the twenty that enter camp for the Hawks. That would be fun. Um, it would be, and I hope he ends up on the roster because I, he, he's just so, so much fun. I don't know if he'll ever be a real NBA player in terms of real legitimate rotational player, but to have a guy who starts with kind of having it all figured out in the defensive end and just needing to kind of figure out what he is in the offensive end, that's kind of atypical. Most of the guys in the league are there because of what they can do offensively or trying to figure out defensively, but when, when it's the other way around, a little bit like that kind of Bembry is, you know, we think about him in that way sometimes, you know, um, would be, would be, would be, be, be fun. I, I can't wait to go watch him play again in a couple of days. <laughs> All right. So three, I mean, I've got three other guys I want to talk about. Maybe you'll have more, but I want to talk about Bruno Fernando again, what you saw to him today and also Charlie Brown Jr. And, Jordan Jordan Seibert made a lot of shots. He did. Uh, where do you want to start? We can start with Bruno if you want. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad. 
Okay. Um, which, which shouldn't be surprising from what I saw. I mean, I'll be interested, interested to get your take. Um, really good defensively in the half court. Um, was very impressed on several plays where he would really get up on the floor and help at the ball screen and still have 100% awareness of where his guy is and get back to him and get a body on him. I remember one play specifically, he really had no shot at getting the rebound, so he helped on the, on the ball screen. And then the ball was moved to the perimeter, and the perimeter shot was taken, and he scrambled back to get a bo- his body on his guy, even though there was no chance he was going to get the rebound. And so he wasn't just stat-seeking at all. He was trying to handle his responsibility. So the A-plus in that area in terms of kind of like a Taj, just his defensive range is really, really good. He moves really, really well for a guy that big. Um, but when Indiana was able to push the ball and create strains of some possessions, even if it wasn't technically a fast break, Mm-hmm. Um, he was he was totally lost in terms of how to present himself as a rim protector, and the way that I, you know, the, it's certainly not a complete evaluation, but where I am with him today is when he's like, okay, here, my guy is here, the ball is there, the guy defending the ball handler is there. I know what I'm to do. I know how to navigate the screen. I know how to help. I know how to re- get back and recover. And even when he's off the ball and out of the play defensively in the half court. He seems sure of like when he needs to move to the rim to offer help and to deter another guy from wanting to dribble towards the paint. But when it's a fast break or if it's a situation where the other team is pushing the ball back and Bruno and his teammates are not able to get set up and organized the way they want to, he's completely lost. I mean, there's guys dribbling straight at him at the rim and he would just step aside and they would just dunk because he was just not sure what he's supposed to be doing at at that point of view. So defensively... um, you know, starting with being effective and have court to good start, but in the NBA, of course, you got to know how to get organized when things aren't uh, optimal because many teams try to push that pace and, and set that up. The funniest thing is what he's done best, the both times I've seen him play, is creating his own shot for himself off the dribble, which is not what you typically, <laughs> you know, have ideal, ideally see as the, 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 you know, the kind of the clear straight. But he looks like freaking Michael Jordan <laughs> right now in the post is taking his guy off the dribble and hitting turnaround shots. He hasn't missed one yet. And then I think both games he's played, the only catch and shoot three he had was an air ball. Um, he had one that, today. He had one today. He air balled another turnaround too. Like he, yeah. he did miss one of those oh, yeah, turnarounds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. came like way short. But yeah, yeah but, that, uh, that one where he like attacked a closeout and just kind of dribbled into a pull up like he was, you know, Steve Smith. Yes. It's like, come on, stop. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's the part of his game where it's like you're there looks like there's some fun potential there, but you don't really know if that's what the Hawks really envision him being at all as a guy like you know creating his own shot. But in summer league, it's fun. But uh, but it it but that to, I think of what I wrote because I did the follow up of game two, which was not the most fun game to write about. Um, but I. Um, well, how did I put it? Um, so with with oh, I I he had one possession in game two where he was attacking a closeout, but he attacked it so quickly that he put his defender back in the play instead of letting his defender get like all the way to the perimeter. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote he'll learn to right. wait wait a tick or two more and let that guy get all the way out of the play. Right. But today today he did a little better. He let his, he let the defender get further out and got he that. Out of the play, so hey, from game three to game three, there's 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 progress. But, um, but I don't, what this hints at, I think mostly, is that there is some reason to be optimistic about him as a shooter. He's knocking down shots that guys that his size and position uh, typically can't do at this point in his career. And I don't know if that means he'll get to have a lot of ISO ISO possessions and things like that. Maybe probably not. But functioning as a shooter, that's good news. Yeah, I'm I'm all in on his shooting. Like I I I think it's going to be rough at at the start. I mean, I think he's going to be a project shooter in the way that Deadman and Len and John Collins were kind of project shooters, and he'll get it. His mechanic is there. They drafted him because they know it's there. Uh, he's going to be fine as a shooter. He just doesn't have the game reps yet. So when he goes, you know, ten minutes without getting a jump shot, it's just going to feel different, and it's you know. You have to learn how to keep that muscle memory when you don't get the touches and you don't get the same shots. He'll get it. It'll just take a little bit of time. 
Um, for sure, but, yeah, for sure. But I think the most actually, but I totally missed on this. Um, the most encouraging thing that he does in offense is he just moves the basketball. The ball does not stick with him ever. Yeah. And you know, when he's supposed to be SQDHO, he hands the ball off. He sets the screen, and you know, so I he's making the right plays and making the right reads. Is even in his first game, you know, I considered you know Amari was still on the team for his first three games, <laughs> but uh, Bruno was recognizing things before Amari was. Right. Which was the price of the week. I consider an Armari a pretty high IQ player, you know. But uh, he was seeing the floor well. His very first play was a skip past Amari in the corner for yep. three shots. So the ball movement was there. And then today, in his second game, the Hawks' third game, he got double teamed in the in the post one time. They had a mismatch, and they like, swung the ball to him. Yep. And I was when, as soon as they double teamed, I was like, Oh no! Because because that double team to... snuck on him from from behind. It wasn't he didn't see the double team, but it, it, it took him a minute. And then when he did see it. He kicked her instantly. He did, and I wrote. Um, no, I think Greg wrote uh, Fernando's uh, draft profile for Peace Reviews. But, um, um, but when I did my research on him, he had a really high uh, turnover rate at, at Maryland, even this last year. And when I went to dig in on, you know, what is that? Does he have bad bad hands? You know, and it was almost all of them were like when teams would double him, he just did not know what to do at all, and mm-hmm. he would sneak out, make a terrible pass, or it would be like, I don't want to make a bad pass. So he, he like, you know, when guys hurry up and get a shot off, before they get the defender, seriously, they don't have to make a read, you know? You see guys do that? He did a lot of that. But I was like, as soon as they double teamed him today, I was terrified. Like, oh, no, this is not going to go well. But he handled it, like, as better than I ever saw him do it in college. So that was kind of weird. But Yeah, I think he's going to be good at that. Okay, do you, yeah. want, do you want the good news or the fun news? Oh, always the fun news. Okay. He, you mentioned, like, the, the dribble handoffs and he set a screen. He he did a fake dribble handoff today, and that's that's just well, he got that dunk. Yeah, that's the, that's the quick way to my heart is with the fake dribble handoff. That's the Draymond play where the, the opposing defense is overplaying the the quote ball handler that's like lifting the DHO, and you basically it's the equivalent of slipping a slipping a screen, right? Yep. With, without the ball, it's you're slipping slipping the screen. With the ball, you're faking the handoff and getting downhill and getting the dunk. So that that was yeah good 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 on you for remembering that. That that was one of his better plays today. But the good news. I think he's immovable. Like when he sets a pick, like the bodies bounce off him. And yep. when he when he was boxing people out, he just didn't move. Like if they tried to nudge him from behind, he like just did not move. He's immovable. Yeah. I think he's really strong. Uh, so, you know, I, I just yeah, think and, that and has a lot like, of potential. Yeah, and in basketball, because basketball is kind of a finesse sport in, in a lot of ways. You'll sometimes see big, strong guys that don't want to do those things. It's really fun, to your point, and good news when you see a guy who's big and strong and and it seems to enjoy applying that part of it, his game. You know, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it was like by the third quarter, you'd see him go to set a screen and the guy he's maybe already tagged like three, four, or five times. And the guy was like, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm done with this." <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh... Jordan Seibert, he made a lot of threes. What was he seven for nine today? I don't know. It was a lot. There were some I, long ones too. There were. Yeah. Uh, he is. That's what the one thing he can do is shoot the basketball. Right. Uh, he's not a great dribbler. Nope. He's. I don't know that he knows what a pass is. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, I, I think there are times he, in his mind he's playing one on five. Uh, out there um but i mean he had a good year in the g league last year because he can knock down shots um but he doesn't really offer a whole lot else so i i it was funny when i was talking to brad i was like brad are you ready for a cyber uh to be uh all up in your mentions after this game him having this big game and he was like, <laughs> he's like glenn it's already happening um but yeah <laughs> That's the thing is that he he can shoot the basketball, but he's a hot and cold shooter. Like he shot the ball horribly on Sunday. You know, he and Jalen Adams combined to go 0 for 10 from the three point line on Sunday, and so it looks really good. It looks really fun when he's knocking him down, but when he's not knocking him down, he really has nothing else to go to to kind of help his team. So that I don't know if you see it differently than that or not, but no, that's that sounds good to me. If you have strong feelings on Jordan Seibert. It's at BT Roland. Make sure that, that Brad hears from you. Yes. He, he's, he's appreciative of it, even. So. Uh, Charlie Brown. <laughs> oh, um, 
had a slow start offensively. Not a surprise, it's, you know. Um, you can tell he was fine trying to. It's it's funny when you watch a guy play like that. At least this is how I watch the games. You can tell early, even those, those shots weren't going in. He was really like, I need to find my rhythm. I need to find my rhythm, and he just kept working on it uh, without forcing it too much. And then he found his rhythm. And then you're like, oh, okay, I get why he's on a two-way contract. He's like, they grabbed him. What? I not even in two hours after the draft, he'd already uh, agreed to the deal. I think. Right. Um, but I what I put into the slack was. Professional scorer, I have no doubt he can be a good enough scorer to, to have a place in the NBA, but he was dying on every screen uh, today. <laughs> Just, I mean, hey, you know, Jalen Adams is going to get a lot of crap for this week. He's gotten a lot better at that. He has. And I think. Today, especially today, I give Jalen credit that he, even though nothing was really going right for him offensively, no, even it wasn't. Jaylen, his passes were like all over the place. Yeah, they were they yeah. just throwing passes out of bounds, missing guys by like ten feet. Yeah. And but you know what? He kept playing defense. He did. And he he kept playing really hard on defense, and that was a part of the why the reason the Pacers um, never really got back in the game was That's there was right. a group of guys on the floor that just kept playing defense. Yep. All right. Yeah. I might. I don't know why, but Charlie Brown reminds me of Marco Bellinelli. I, something about his shot and the way he moves off the ball. He kind of a he got that little bit of a gunner in him, and he kind of tilts it. I think like his body is very perpendicular to the front of the rim when he shoots. He kind of leans the same way. I don't know why he reminds me of Marco Bellinelli, but it's gonna take me a while to shake that. No, yeah. I mean Bellinelli's like, I know he's a bench guy and he's not good at defense, but you know he he had like a ten year NBA career. Brown probably won't ever have that, but. Just stylistically, there's something about him that reminds me of Bellinelli. I, I, I'm going to have to keep probe it and either get rid of it or stick with it, but that, that's where I was after today. Yeah, well, he's, he, his release point reminds me a lot of Marco, you know, right right over his head, and then he's about the same size as Marco. Yeah. And, I mean, Marco played real rotation minutes on contending teams, you know. Oh, so for sure. He had, certainly has value. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but with... Um, with, with Brown, it's going to be, what well, can anything else come around? I didn't really see much passing for him today. Yeah. Um, but, man, his, his, the one thing that jumps out at you is that the balance he has, whether he's shooting, regardless of where his defender is, and attacking the rim, his ability to maintain balance was yes. really impressive. It's exactly. a little Jamal, Jamal Murray-esque. Jamal Murray obviously does it at a way higher level, and people are still divided on, you know, <laughs> well, Murray is well, we, so we might be on opposite sides of that <laughs> Which which I yeah. do like. No, I don't know. I I'm probably lower on Jamal Murray than most, but he does have good balance. I will give you that. Yes. So uh, I yeah. We don't have to debate that now, but no, I yeah, except I'm, another I'm, time. I'm, probably, I'm as about as high as anyone, so just to go on record. <laughs> All right. Go go enjoy Vegas. That's enough Hawks for July ninth, two thousand nineteen. It is, and if you want to know like how much I'm leveraging the Vegas lifestyle, just recall that about 30 minutes ago I said I listened to the Low Post John Collins podcast while I was having dinner last <laughs> night. So that tells you how how hard I'm hitting the casinos, <laughs> or not. <laughs> plug plug what you want to plug. Yeah, so um, Full Court Press and NBA podcast. Um, we are transitioning into the off season where we do two teams a week, um, and we'll get through all 30 teams updates. You know, who they lose, who they add, what do we think, um, those sorts of things. So those, those will start coming out um, next week. Um, uh, Greg is fit, wrapping up uh, his AAU uh, season uh, in Virginia, and so that'll be kind of in the rearview mirror. So check us out there. And as always, Greg and I both contribute at Peace Tree Hoops. Um, and this is going to be a fun team to write about, I think, this coming season. And you know, it'll it'll get a little slow in August in terms of having really interesting things to write about. But before you know it, the camp will be here, and we'll have preseason games, and we'll be putting up profiles on whoever the last 15 to 16, 17 players on the roster are. So, as always, check out our, our work there. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Glenn. My pleasure. Always fun talking to you. My voice, I think, just barely made it. <laughs> <laughs> you need to ice it with some beer. I, I, I will have no problem finding the deer in Las Vegas. <laughs> have a good one, sir. Thank you, Kevin.